Welcome to our panel session on the topic of money, risk, shame, and reputation in scenting responsible behavior in space. Space domain has, be has become increasingly complex. We have more satellites, space applications and technologies, space users, and space operators relying upon having a stable orbital environment than we have ever had before. And that trend continues to increase. The complexity of the operating domain will only become more uh, more complex in the coming years. New activities and new actors brings with it the potential for increased benefit, but it also brings challenges to space sustainability that cannot and perhaps should not be addressed through regulation alone. We must find business and community rationale to develop responsible and implement responsible behavior in space. There's been much discussion about using positive and negative uh, incentives to encourage responsible behavior in space, but few practical proposals. This panel aims to explore how to best develop some practical approaches. Uh, we want to discuss themes such as in managing an increasingly complex orbital environment, what role is there for voluntary commitment and best practices? How do we track and monitor performance towards those commitments? And what role does the insurance and investment communities have to play in incenting or encouraging res responsible private sector space activities? Can we draw lessons or experience from other sectors in encouraging the private sector to act in uh, sustainable and responsible ways in space. So over the next 15 minutes, we plan to dive into these topics. Uh, we have a panel of experts that I think is very well placed to look at these topics from multiple angles, technical, business, and economics. You can find their full bios on the Summit webpage, but I do want to briefly introduce each of them. Uh, Francesca Leticia is a space debris engineer at the European Space Agency Space Debris Office where she leads assessments of general compliance to space debris mitigation guidelines by operators and the development of metrics to, to assess the contribution of missions to the overall space debris environment. Francesca is also a member of a multi-organization team developing a space sustainability rating. So Francesca, I guess that means uh, in, in terms of the scope of our panel, you're covering reputation today. Chris Boshausen is an operating partner at DCVC, or Data Collective, a San Francisco-based venture capital firm where he leads that firm's investment in space and other deep tech companies. Uh, the space portfolio at DCVC includes such firms as Rocket Labs, Capella Space, and Planet. Uh, Chris was also a co-founder of Planet where he was the firm's chief technology officer. Uh, Chris, looks like you're the money angle today uh, in our conversation. Uh, Nishant Choksi is the managing director of Ares Advisors uh, he has over 17 years of experience in space and insurance brokerage industries, where he specializes in risk management and large portfolio placements and claims. Nishant, clearly you're covering the risk angle in our discussion today. Uh, Jim Boyd is a senior fellow and holds the Thomas Klutznik Chair in Environmental Policy at Resources for the Future. He's also the Director of Social Science and Policy at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. An economist by training, Jim's research emphasizes collaborations between ecologists and economists in order to guide decisions that affect natural resources. Uh, so Jim, uh, I guess that leaves you with the shame angle. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so with that, we'll get right into the discussion here. I'm excited for it. Uh, just a brief word on format. We'll start off with some moderator-led discussion, uh, but we're going to leave plenty of time for audience questioning uh, and interaction. So please do submit your questions via the, uh, the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, again, that's where we'll be looking as the, as the moderator to um, to see the question, so please do use that feature. Um, and so with that, uh, let me switch over to, uh, to our first question, and that is for Francesca. Uh, in your work with the Space Debris Office at ESA, Francesca, you are involved in research tracking and evaluating potential risks in the space environment. In your viewpoint, what are the, what are the most pressing challenges operators must address, and how can initiatives like the Space Sustainability Rating encourage that? Uh, those operators to, to do so. Hello, and thank you for having me here today. So um, to reply to your question, so what we are witnessing in uh, in these recent years is a dramatic increase in the in the launch traffic. So just to give some numbers, while maybe 20 years ago we were launching around 100 satellites per year, uh, now already this year we have launched more than 600 satellites. And uh, if we try to see what this means in terms of the impact on the environment in the long term, we find that uh, the current level 
level of activity combined with the current level of adoption of mitigation guidelines is not sustainable in the sense that if we continue like now, we would observe um, an exponential growth uh, in the number of debris objects. So uh, the, the main challenge to be addressed is exactly how to improve uh, the, the compliance rate for what concerns the, the disposal of satellites and uh, at the end of their missions and the, the minimization of uh, breakups uh, in orbit. And um, so for this last point, uh, there are several actions the op that operators uh, can take to minimize the risk uh, of breakups, uh, for example, from ensuring that the spacecraft is properly passivated at the end of the mission or testing new platform uh, first at lower altitudes. And instead, for what concerns the, the end of life disposal, we also see uh, that there is a large margin uh, for improvement. So uh, we, if we look at the current statistics, uh, we see that in LEO only uh, around 20% of the satellites, they should perform a disposal maneuver uh, to actually try to do so. And so the improving in this, uh, in this aspect is really essential uh, to ensure sustainable operation uh, in space. And now, if we want uh, to be more positive, uh, we can look at the, at the geo region, uh, where actually the level of compliance is much higher and consistently above 80% in, uh, in these last years. And so one can ask why there is this difference uh, with respect to, to LEO. And uh, one reason uh, may be that in, uh, in GEO, operators um, clearly see the economic and the operational advantage of keeping this region uh, free from inactive spacecraft. And so in order to make uh, this link uh, more visible for, uh, for any operator, uh, we have been working on initiatives such as the, the space sustainability rating uh, that you mentioned before. So on one end, uh, one of the elements of the, of the rating is what we call the uh, environmental impact assessment of emission. So in essence, basically, we perform this assessment by estimating which is the probability for a spacecraft um, to break up in orbit, for example, because of a collision or because of an explosion. And then we look at which is the, pot the potential effect of this fragmentation on other active satellites. So we do this um, basically to contribute to create this link between current behaviors and future operation. Uh, and we have seen that this could be part of the reason why we, uh, we observe better compliance values in, uh, in GEO. And, uh, on the an additional aspect, let's say, is also that we believe that this kind of assessment so, uh, of the mission provide an additional granularity with respect to just checking if uh, an orbit um, or sorry, a mission is compliant or not. And this could be useful, for example, especially for newcomer operators to understand how different choices in the mission architecture may have a different impact on the on the debris environment. And on top of this, if we look at operating in space as a shared resource. Um, then this approach also encourages more transparency in showing how different actors are consuming this, uh, this shared resource. And then, as you uh, mentioned in the, also in the introduction, um, what we are trying to do with the space sustainability rating is also to try to put emphasis on good behavior. So this means that we are not trying to create a new set of guidelines, but uh, rather to recognize operators that uh, comply to them the, or they go even beyond uh, by adopting measures that try to reduce, uh, which is the disruption that they can cause to neighboring missions uh, in the short term or uh, more in general to, to the environment. So in, in summary, uh, the way we think that the, the space sustainability rating can encourage operator is uh, by making more explicit this link between current behaviors and sustainable uh, operations by offering more transparency and also offering a framework for positive recognition. All right. Well, thank you for that. And I think there's a couple of things that we can return to there are important. Um, just to the, the, the idea of transparency and how that may help us think about being um, being more responsible. And then the idea of a positive uh, encouragement is, is something I think we will definitely want to return to. So, um, Chris, the next question um, is, is for you. Um, so uh, Leticia has described, or uh, Francesca, excuse me, has described a, a, an effort to better kind of quantify and, and be more transparent about space sustainability challenges and our performance towards them. Um, in your role as an investor and as a venture capitalist, to what degree do these space sustainability challenges even matter in making investment decisions? And, and, what does, and how does that relate to the role or any role that the investment community might have in encouraging responsible space behavior? Yeah, that's a great question. I think my answer is different because of my NASA and planet experience. So we, um, 
you know, at Planet, um, we well, actually before we started Planet, we you know we were working actively on new approaches to debris management and to conjunction analysis. And the people that we worked with at NASA ended ultimately joined Planet. So Planet had that in its culture, and so I've taken that to DCVC. I'm not sure though that's in, universally true for the investment community at large though. Um, and the reason for that is, is that they just don't have that shared experience and they don't know about it. And so I think one of the my main recommendations for um, you know, new companies and Francesca, I think what one of my observations is the difference between Leo and Geo is that the Geo community have lived and breathed that for 40 years. And a lot of the new entrants in the Leo market are new operators. Sometimes space companies started by people with absolutely no space background, which on one hand is absolutely amazing, and on the other hand, completely terrifying. And so sort of bridging that gap where we want to encourage new people to enter our, our industry and bring new ideas to us, but also kind of catch up on the history and the important dimensions of this business that they need to understand. And so I use my role at Data Collective to evangelize a lot of you know, uh, orbital, you know, uh, debris and collision and space traffic management, space situational awareness concepts, and I promulgate that from my role, and I encourage my fellow VCs to do the same. But I think we do have an education gap, both in the investment community and the and the startup community. So, so education and, and information sharing as a as a starting point before we can even begin to think about um, incentives around behavior. So let, let, let's. Yeah. Yeah, let's you've got to know the problem exists to be able to know you want to solve it. Yeah, excellent. Let's uh, let's let's hold that point and come back to it shortly. So, uh, Nishant, over to you now for the insurance side of this. So, it's often in our community suggested uh, that the space insurance sector uh, can act can enact policies and pricings to reward or encourage private actors to act responsibly. How would you react to that? Can we have a safe driver discount for space operations? Yeah, thank, thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, to answer that question um, more directly, uh, we've already heard from Francesca and Chris, and, and they've introduced elements of things that I consider on a daily basis from an insurance perspective. And that is, what is the risk? Can we understand it? And how can we price it? And how can we price it to a sustainable level to maintain uh, a, a space insurance industry that can support this broader uh, changes in the uh, space industry at large. Um, so, so I guess it, to give you a bit of background, the, the purpose of the space in insurance industry is to enable space businesses to help them protect their balance sheets against uh, space related risk. Uh, but this needs to be done at a pricing level that's sustainable for the industry. Um, we try to price a risk at a point where we believe it's commensurate with the risk being sought. Um, and those risk profiles these days are absolutely changing, as Francesca uh, noted earlier. Um, we, so here we can offer actual real solutions, but they have to be at a good price, have to be at a fair price. Um, but clearly, these are exciting times uh, for the space industry and for us as space insurers. Uh, to respond to your question directly, uh, absolutely, we can offer a safe driver discount. And, and I would say to a large extent, this is actually already incorporated into our pricing models. Um, however, we do see challenges for the new space operators. The challenge is how space activities are defined. And today, we do not see that they, they actually are. Um, we have our own view of what safe means from a technical perspective, from an insurance policy perspective. But the expansion of the industry is creating these new risk profiles to evaluate. And it's natural that the growth creates uncertainty uh, and this leads to a potential increase in the risk. Um, there's, there's actually two pieces that I would kind of uh, highlight from an insurance perspective. Uh, for liability insurance, those are risks that impact third parties. So everyone's concerned really about the um, uh, collision risk, uh, space situational awareness. Um, we find that nations that require these have different requirements. Um, at times, it may be uh, the case where um, it's not very uh, feasible or practical even to measure what we consider to be the maximum probable loss, which is how rating and insurability is determined from a liability standpoint. Um, it's a difficult calculation for not only nations, but also those uh, actors that are required to insure against uh, those uh, liability risks. So it is a, it is a bit uh, difficult. Then from my perspective, 
I need insight into aspects such as operational plans for collision avoidance, deorbit plans, other contingencies that would help de-risk the liability. Um, and to what extent different space operators can actually do this varies greatly. Um, and I think Chris actually mentioned that as well um, earlier. The other aspect is the asset coverage, which is the act insurance against the actual physical loss um, of your own first of your own uh, space asset. Uh, we can also look at not just physical, but also um, uh, loss of revenues. Um, but that's purely at the discretion of the space actor. And at times it could be uh, a requirement of their investors. Um, so to give you a bit of perspective, the established operators who are familiar with space insurance and its benefits do see a safe driver discount because we have transparency and technical aspects such as flight heritage, technical depth and breadth of their teams. Uh, we have statistical evidence to support um, uh, quality and reliability statistics that support overall missions. Uh, we would expect to see the same level of inf information and transparency on the new space operators, but that's really not always the case. Um, and, and in closing, I really want to highlight the fact that the, the space insurance industry has already in the last three to five years been able to demonstrate its ability to create new insurance solutions to cover some of these new risk aspects. It's the adaptation and awareness of those benefits to, of space insurance that continue to, I would say, elude the broader spectrum of buyers and operators in the new space sector. Um, and it's the ability to insure against the risk of loss uh, that benefits not just the operator buying insurance, but the customers, the regulators, the investors, and the broader space community. So I, I really feel that that is the real value creation of space insurance uh, to lead to sustainability in this, uh, in this industry. Thank you for that, Nishant. It's a couple of things there that, that I was trying to try, <laughs> trying to jot down here so that we come back to. But there's there's a clear thematic link between you're, you're talking about awareness of the role of the insurance industry plays in its and its products and, and ability to to develop those things to the to what Chris was saying about just awareness within the his sector about um, some of the challenges that we face. So clearly, there's a theme already developing around. Um, what we can do to educate and, and, and broaden broaden awareness. Um, so, Jim, I want I want to come to you now. Now, you are you're coming to us from outside of the space domain, but you've done a, done a lot of work in environmental economics and re natural resources management, looking at uh, what I might call analogous challenges um, in, in different sectors to what we're looking at um, in our community. Uh, so, as you listen to the challenges that we've discussed so far on this panel and, and perhaps in the previous one, um, is there anything that you're thinking about from the experience with natural resources management, environmental economics that might be um, immediately coming to mind as, as, as relevant here. Uh, you're muted, sir. Sorry, um, thanks Ian. Um, yeah, several things. And I actually, if I had to pick one thing to focus on, it would be to build on uh, Nishan's comments related to insurance. So there's an important analogy in the environmental policy arena to this space insurance issue. And that is um, that insurance plays a hugely important role in deterrence of damages and reduction of risk in the environmental area. Whenever you put an oil tanker out to sea, whenever you build a gas station, whenever you build a landfill, you actually are required um, by U.S. law to um, have insurance coverage, much like you're required to have insurance coverage as an automobile driver. And that requirement to have insurance um, plays this incredible behavioral role in my view. Um, and that is, we, we tend to think of environmental regulation as, you know, do this, do that. But these insurance requirements harness the power of the market, harness the incentives uh, created by different types of pricing like Nishant's concerned about. And so that's a clear analogy. Uh, the, one, the one thing I wanna add to what Nishant said is the importance in my view of mandatory insurance. If you leave it as a voluntary thing, it can, work to a certain extent, but I'd like to put out there for a discussion the idea of what are called financial responsibility requirements or mandatory insurance requirements, um, which actually helps stimulate the insurance market. 
and uh, level the playing field for all the actors concerned. So that's one analogy that's very clear. Shifting gears a little bit, the problem of orbital congestion also has analogs in the environmental arena. Um, we worry a lot about automobile congestion and develop policies for dealing with that. So uh, intuitively, you know, we, we impose tolls on cars to, uh, in effect, um, A, raise revenue, but also lead people to change their driving behavior in a way that reduces congestion. Another alternative is kind of the HOV lane analogy, and I'm not quite sure how this would work in the space context, but basically what you're doing there is you're allocating slots based on particular behaviors. Um, you know, how many people you have in the car, in the space context, I'd be interested in your thoughts on you know, allocating uh, space to platforms that have particular technological characteristics and things like that. That's another analogy we could explore. Um, and then uh, environmental economists actually did a lot of early work on spectrum allocation because environmental economists worry about public goods and the commons. And so there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from my world, I think, in terms of any of those spectrum allocation questions. Again, how you allocate uh, scarce spectrum, either via auction or by giving spectrum as a property right and then allowing people to trade that property right to get to the highest value uses. So these are all, um, all analogies that I think are worth exploring, but the direct answer to your question, I think the insurance angle is uh, the most appealing and in, from my work on environmental issues, um, arguably the most important thing to explore more deeply. All right, thank you for that. I think there's, um, there's a lot there that we could pick up for on discussion. And that's great because we're now coming to the portion of the panel that is meant to be that discussion. Um, so I'm beginning to see some audience questions come in. Please, uh, audience members, please do submit those questions um, through, through the Q&A and uh, upvote the ones you'd really want us to, to ask. Um, but I want to pick up on something, Jim, you were just, just talking about right there. And that was um, the potential to have a, a requirement for insurance. So there are a few, uh, and I say few very deliberately, a few jurisdictions in the space world that require on-orbit uh, insurance. It is not particularly common. Uh, we typically have launch insurance, and that's to protect the business investment, but we do not typically require on-orbit um, on insurance. Um, there's a currently uh, current rulemaking action moving through the, the FCC in the U.S., which has the space debris mitigation requirement role um, in the U.S. space regulatory system that is... Uh, requesting comment on requiring an indem uh, putting into place an indemnif indemnification requirement so that private operators would indemnify uh, the U.S. government against liability uh, concerns around, around debris operations. Um, so uh, curious from, uh, I think, Nishant and, and Chris in particular, how you would react to some of the suggestions Jim just made around requiring insurance, given the context that we have in our industry and some of the uh, emerging businesses that we're looking at. Yeah, Nishant, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I think, um, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, you know, when it comes to, we're, we're at the, um, I would say the early days of some of these new risk uh, uh, profiles emerging. Um, we, we've seen, we understand that there are risks related to uh, collisions and liabilities and space operators want to protect their own assets. So there's, there's different classes of risks that we need to consider. Uh, what the right product is and how that fits into it um, as Jim was uh, mentioning earlier, is it going to be mandatory or required? Uh, clearly, from my perspective, you know, insurance, no matter what kind of vertical you're playing in, is a, is a cyclical kind of business. You have, you have claims uh, that lead to rate movements. Uh, you have uh, introduces more capacity into the market. That capacity dry, uh, comes in, creates more competition, and all of a sudden you see rates dropping. And then you kind of go through that cycle uh, yet again. Um, you know, when we're at the early days of these types of risks, um, you know, there is a tendency for, for uh, some insurers to take a view that certain risks should be excluded simply because we don't fully understand or have an appreciation for it. Uh, there's other risks that we do understand and we can price those, 
but those might come at premiums that might not be adequate or feasible for space operators to, to buy that level of insurance, might be too expensive. Um, so finding that commonality uh, is possible. Now, if you take the route that it needs to be required, um, you're going to you're going to attract a lot of business. You're going to attract a lot of capacity because they see a development of a market. And these are for profit companies, right? So looking to generate uh, expand revenue. Um, if we see a market expanding, that's opportunity for insurers to to, to enter. Um, until we see start seeing a level of claims activity or a lack thereof, uh, that's really going to determine where that pricing goes and what insurers are going to or not going to be able to buy uh, levels of insurance. Yeah, so I think um, uh, James actually um, brought up a great analogy, which is that of the automobile. So, if, you know, on, on our roads, we solved these problems a very long time ago. And, um, you know, we, most countries have mandatory third party insurance. Um, you know, so in space, if you, for your own business case, feel like you don't need to insure your own asset for, for loss, that's okay, that's acceptable. But I think it's not acceptable that, um, you know, you could potentially, you know, cause harm to someone else. And it ultimately, right now, um, as you mentioned, Ashant, the liability transfers to the state um, under the treaty. So you're basically, you know, exposing as we have, as we encourage more people to start space startups and other types of enterprises in orbit. Um, we're increasing the liability for our governments. Um, we don't want to lose our right to do that, so we really need to help them out. And so I think that's a fair ask from, for governments to mandate that companies have third-party liability insurance. Um, another point about the car example is um, the situation we have in Leo right now is you can be driving your car, and if it breaks down, you get out and you leave it there. And you just leave it there forever on the highway. And so space debris you can think of as a, as a highway where just the broken down cars keep accumulating. And at some point you can't drive anymore. And so I think we need to go further than just um, having um, legal and fiscal tools um, to solve this problem. I think we also need to make sure that people can afford to pay for the debris removal. And so that's an additional layer of insurance that I think people should have um, where if their asset fails, they are on the hook for all, all of the recovery costs to restore free access to that public commons. And um, so I'm, you know, I think this is a you know, fairly new idea, um, but a number of companies and startups are pushing this, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's um, probably one of the biggest tools that we need to put in place, which is you just can't leave your broken down car on the freeway anymore. Yeah, can I jump in here on Chris's point? Yeah, there's also an analogy to exactly what you were saying there in the environmental field um, that relates to mining activities, the, the end of the life of landfills, things like that, where um, there are bonding requirements uh, that ensure uh, the, that money is available for any uh, repair or uh, uh, accidents that occur after the lifetime of the landfill or the mine. And the insurance industry plays a role in that bonding activity as well. So I'm really glad you made that point. All right, thanks. All this stuff is very interesting. I wanna um, ask one more question as a moderator and then I'm gonna go to the, um, start going to the audience question and answer. But um, Chris, so you said, you know, it's acceptable behavior to leave your car on the highway and walk away from it, right? Um, so uh, the question I want to ask, and I think I'm going to ask Francesca to start and then the other, uh, other panelists to, to, to weigh in here is, um, can we even, how can we talk about incentivizing or encouraging responsible behavior if we don't know what responsible behavior is? Do we have a baseline in our community for identifying what a responsible space actor, be that a commercial actor or a government actor, what that looks like. Um, so, uh, Francisca, can, can you talk about that from the standpoint of the space sustainability rating? And then I'd be curious to hear other panelists' reaction. Yes, so uh, I think that on one end, we, we have actually already the, the tools to define such baseline. And somehow you can think that this baseline has already been defined, even it maybe not articulated in a single document or, or guideline. So. 
if um, if we think at the problem of space debris, we can see that there are two dimensions to the problem, the long term and the short term. So for the long term, there is a continuous ongoing effort in uh, international bodies such as the Interagency Space Debris Committee to model the debris environment, its, its sensitivity to different parameters as, for example, the, the compliance to mitigation measures. And this can help in identifying uh, which actions um, are expected to have the, the largest positive impact and so define this minimum level of uh, responsible behavior in, uh, in space. And for the short term one, uh, instead we can look uh, mainly at the, for example, the collision avoidance process and how operators can minimize uh, the burden on um, other operators, but also on the space of various systems uh, in, the, in general. And so we look at action uh, such as communicate the maneuverability of, uh, of the satellite screen and maneuvers, all these elements that were mentioned also in, uh, in the previous panel. And here we see that the, the cooperation among operators can really be um, positive in shaping this best practice practices and contributing again uh, to define which is the minimum level of uh, responsible behavior. And um, for what concerns the, the space sustainability rating uh, in spe uh, specifically, as you, as you asked, um, these are all elements that are actually a par are part of the, the, of the rating. So the rating will be composed by different modules and some of the modules uh, exactly are, for example, on what operators are doing in terms of uh, data sharing or the, uh, their collision avoidance uh, operation, et cetera. And it's also always important to keep in mind that the, the step that should always be done when we look at this best practice is also to understand um, how we can then feedback uh, this also to this long-term simulation of the environment to understand really uh, what are also the, the long-term implications. But I think that the tools are there and it's possible to define this, uh, this baseline. Thank you for that. Um, any of the other panelists uh, have, have a perspective on either what Francesca has said or on the, the question of whether we even uh, know what a baseline of responsible behavior um, is? Well, I think it's changing, right? I mean, um, back when we, you know, had really just one or two CubeSats and then more or less SpaceX and um, every other launch vehicle was launching a GeoSat, um, I think things were fairly stable. Um, but now that we've got a large number of, you know, uh, small to, you know, largest satellites in LEO and MEO um, and increasing numbers of them, you know, the, the situation is changing. And I think we've learned a lot. I mean, I, I think, you know, even some of the things we talked about today were not even considered at similar conferences five or 10 years ago. And we, we talked about SSA, space traffic, ma space situation awareness was a topic, but not really about the responses to you know, derelict satellites and, you know, collisions and so on. So I think these are the new dimensions that, frankly, we as a community are just discovering. Um, and so, you know, it, that, that needs to become mainstream, but I don't think it is yet. All right, thanks. So um, let's, uh, let's start turning to our audience now. Um, we, have a, we have a number of questions submitted through the chat, so I'm trying to start weaving those into the conversation here. Um, and I want to start with with this one. Um, so we've been talking a lot in this panel about commercial activity, new actors, and new commercial business models and new uses of space. Um, we also should recognize that historically, a lot of the activity in space has been government, and some of the uh, a large portion of the debris objects that we are concerned about are legacy objects from from government activities, right? Um, so the question that's been posed is. Um, how do we incent governments uh, to, to act uh, responsibly? Is, is the incentive structure that we think about there a different set of mechanisms that we might think about for the commercial industry? Um, and so, Jim, maybe I put you on the spot if there's any lessons from the from your domain there, and then um, to others that want to that want to take that on. Sure. Just briefly, um, you know, the government, the federal government in particular, often does. Um, in the environmental context, to take a lead in order to stimulate and demonstrate good behavior. So you'll have energy efficiency requirements for federal facilities, for example, um, uh, recycling, kind of life cycle recycling uh, initiatives. Um, so you do see some of that. Now, the politics of that, though, I mean, basically, it's an interesting question. Why does the federal government do that? It's really about congressional politics. There's, 
got to be a nudge um, from the hill, in effect, to, um, and, and it can be a fairly direct way of getting some experimentation and leadership from the federal agencies happening. Uh, but I, I assume that the, the real driver there is, first of all, the agency's belief that it's the right thing to do, sort of a cultural belief, and then some political and uh, political inducement and budgetary authority to actually be doing that. So to me, what that means is if the private sector sees a role for the government to be proactive in a way it isn't right now, that is kind of a congressional and a political calculus would be my guess. So, so Chris and Nishant, can you maybe pick up on that? How, how can the private sector be more effective to advocate for government action on, 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 um, on some of its um, legacy objects? Um, <laughs> Chris, on you this one. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot we can do about them yet, right? I mean, we can't go and get them um, and move them, really. So that's, you know, hopefully coming in the next decade, but we're not there yet. So all we can really do is track them. And um, I think just being more forthcoming with their catalog and the accuracy of their catalog would be a big step. Um, so that people can predict their collisions and do their, you know, avoidance maneuvers um, with you know, better, um, you know, uh, better information. That's probably the biggest step. Um, and then, you know, obviously having a commitment from this day forward to, you know, for instance, stop tossing, um, you know, second stages into orbit and, and things like that, um, which is something we all need to do. Um, but, the, you know, it's not, one of the sad things about this problem is that once the damage is done, it's done, and at least in terms of our state of art right now, irreversible. Um, so until that changes, um, you know, that we kind of are stuck dealing with the problems that we've got. Um, so I think at least just sharing information is a good start. All right, back to the back to the transparency um, and, and um, information sharing thing that we picked. We started yeah. at the beginning of this, right? Yeah. Um, yep. All right, so. Um, Francesca, we have a couple of questions here um, that, that relate to the sustainability rating um, it, itself. Um, and so just ask a, ask a couple of those um, right now. Um, now, that, now that they've moved, so give me a second to find it again. Um, uh, so the, <coughs> the question has to do with what the, what the rating is measuring. Um, talk about the space sustainability rating and talks about operator behavior. Um, and so we're measuring um, and to, trying to define um, how to compare how operators are behaving in terms of responsibility. Um, should we also not be considering design of satellites as part of this? So um, satellites don't, you know, we don't want to design satellites to fail. Is that also not part of, of responsible behavior? Okay. So uh, first I want to, to say that what we have been doing in these two years of the, uh, in the development of the space sustainability rating, we see it as, um, as a first step. So we are not aiming at solving all the problems uh, in this first uh, iteration. So for sure there are aspects that um, at the moment we are not considering, but then maybe with the evolution that, that we have been mentioning uh, already, uh, there will need to be included later on in the development of the rating. But this aspect of the design, we are uh, already uh, somehow taking into account because uh, one of the elements uh, that we will consider is, for example, the application of standards um, in um, and in the design of the of the mission. So, for example, if you apply uh, the ISO standard, then you will get um, a better rating. So somehow, uh, in um, let's say uh, in an indirect way, these aspects are taken into consideration. Uh, the problem, specifically with the design choices, which is one of the aspects actually that we that we considered in um, in the really initial phase of the um, uh, of the design of the of the rating, is that it's an aspect that is uh, difficult for uh, a, an agency uh, to verify. Uh, so what we would like to, so you would have to go through the documentation of the satellite and do this assessment, which may be not so straightforward and also may uh, rely on information that could be uh, deemed to be 
um, let's say not controversial, but maybe, maybe covered by intellectual property uh, rights. So what we considered for the rating is, it, as I said, um, and I'm talking about this first iteration, is to try to remove these kind of barriers, for example, for um, sharing of data that uh, could be problematic for uh, uh, commercial operators. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the design is considered, but through the application of standards and not through really uh, an analysis of uh, the specific design that the, the operators is adopting. All right, thank you for that. Um, all right, uh, so let's, uh, and apologies, I'm going to jump around the subjects a little bit here, but um, let's return uh, now to the, the discussion of uh, information sharing awareness and education um, that we had uh, at the beginning of this. Um, and so, Chris, I think this is going to be for you uh, to start, but I'm certainly welcome for any other panelists sure. that, that come in on this. Um, the, the question that we have in the chat is, I'm, is about um, how do we educate future space entrepreneurs about space uh, sustainability challenges? And is that, do we want to look for the university system? Um, do we want to build specific programs around space sustainability? But I think there's also a bigger question to this is, then how do we also educate the, um, uh, the investor community that you spoke about, about some of these challenges and what are the, what are the means to, to doing that? So. Yeah, so my, my real concern is um, people from outside the industry who get excited about space. So, you know, the example in my world might be somebody who just sold a software startup and then, you know, it decides it's finally time to return to their love of space. And so they go to Palo Alto VCs and raise a bunch of money. And neither of those two groups of people know anything about space. They just get excited by it and they have a ton of money. They're, they're, that's my biggest concern. So those ones are hard to reach because they don't know what they don't know. Um, for the rest of us that are in this space, including space VCs who, you know, have been coming to space conferences for years, but and know the issues. Um, and people who have degrees in aerospace engineering or have been to the International Space University um, or you know, regularly attend the IAC, those people know of the existence of this problem and I see that their behaviors are very different. So I think we've done a pretty good job in our own community of educating the people that we know and we share that information and everywhere you go in this industry from, from you know, undergraduate university through to ISU and professional life, you hear about it and it is baked in. And I think we've done a very good job of that. Um, the question is, how do we get these other people to say, go to ISU before they start a space company? Or, you know, come to this workshop as part of their learning process to building their business plan. And that's the part that I haven't solved yet. And I'd love to hear ideas about how to, how to sort of broaden that net, um, you know, to, to sort of capture those people and bring them into the community we have here, you know, where we have people like Francesca doing excellent work that is available to them, you, you secure world as well, right? So how, how, do we, how do we embrace them and welcome them in and, and tell them what they need to know? If I can add something on this, um, an, an idea that we, we are considering uh, for the uh, sustainability rating, but also for our work internally in, uh, in ESA is for example, to provide um, a web-based uh, platform where operators can, uh, let's say, submit the uh, main characteristics of their mission and understand how the this rating or the this environmental impact assessment that I mentioned before uh, will change if you change some uh, parameters in the architecture of the mission of the mission because exactly as you as you said Chris before uh, we also think that it's very important to to bridge this education gap and to make more clear how uh, different choices can really have uh, an impact in um, uh, which is the, the effect on the environment on the on the long term. So this is how, from a, a purely technical point of view, uh, we are considering to, to address this, uh, this aspect. Unmute. Um, all right, thank you both, uh, both for that. I mean, it's clearly, uh, I think we can define that we need to do better there um, in terms of, of, of reaching out to some of these new audiences that are, that are driving activity in our, in our segment, but the, the specific challenges of how we do that are, are something I think you know, I know that I, uh, I'm uh, challenged within my own market secure world. So it's, it's a, it's a shared challenge for, for all of us. Um, all right. Uh, going to go back to a, a couple of, uh, of technical questions here. Um, so we have a, we have a question that, that looks at, uh, I think something that that's somewhat related to what Jim raised about, um, 
certain orbital zones or, you know, the HOV concept, right? How, if we can apply that to, um, to space operations, um, to, and this question, I think it's any panelist who wants to take it. Um, we have seen some proposals, um, and some new startups and new businesses to look at, um, trying to utilize a, a region of, of space known as very low earth orbit. Um, so, you know, uh, probably below 250 kilometers, something that would decay naturally very quickly. Um, the question is, do we think this is a, a, an interesting way to balance um, space safety with, um, with, with new, uh, new areas of activity and new, and new innovation? Yeah, can I, do you mind if I take that? I think so. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, I think that's a really interesting idea. So um, one of the sort of, big advantages that CubeSats in the early days had was, um, you know, their small, small surface area and, and um, low orbits, they kind of naturally clean up. Um, and, you know, we, the Earth is bombarded by, you know, several tons of meteorite material every day. So, you know, a, you know, a few satellites that can get completely vaporized is a fairly insignificant um, contribution. There's no real pollution that I, that I believe is measurable from a satellite re-entering the atmosphere. Um, and so it's a pretty cool idea. Um, and so if we can solve that, it, at least those satellites are out of the way. And when your car breaks, breaks down in this case, it cleans itself up. And that's really true of any orbit below 500 kilometers is that you have enough drag that you just self clean up. The real issue is people going higher than that and getting, you know, more excited. So I encourage anyone to go as low as possible for your mission profile. Um, and if you, you know, can use your last single command before your satellite dies or your last drop of fuel to push the orbit down, you should do that because these very low orbits are, are amazing for sort of, you know, self clean up and taking care of the debris. So um, I, I strongly encourage people to look at ideas down there. And, you know, of course, you know, if you're half the distance away from the Earth, you know, if you have a camera, you've got double the resolution. So it's better for your business plan, too. Um, so I, you know, I think there's some exciting business plans just around the corner there. So that may be a, an emerging norm we can continue to converse around is, is if you can use a low orbit as much yeah. as you can possibly use it, let's, let's, uh, let's look, look for that. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, anybody else on that one? All right. Uh, one for Francesca here, kind of a lightning fashion. Um, does the space sustainability rating um, consider environmental impact um, to anything on earth essentially? Or is it just looking at the orbital domain? So, um, yeah, as I said, in this first interac interaction, we on purpose decide to focus only on the in-orbit uh, domain. So we would just look at the, at the space debris issue in itself, and we are not considering aspects such as, for example, the impact of uh, re-entry or uh, uh, the impact on the atmosphere. So these, are, these um, factors are not present at the moment for this current uh, yeah, edition, let's say, of the rating. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got one for Jim here um, from Mark Mulholland. Uh, so Jim, is there an analogy to the Superfund construct? Uh, phase one is to stop polluting space and start being responsible. Uh, many operators understand this. Phase two being more, more complex, how do we clean up the historical mess um, that has been created by prior operations? Yeah, and it, it should worry you all a little bit. <laughs> the Superfund story in a nutshell is that uh, in an era prior to regulation, I'm overstating this, but in the era decades prior to regulation, a lot of pollution was created. And so when it came time to say, wait, that's a big problem, we need to solve that problem. There was then the question of who's gonna pay and uh, Superfund involved a, uh, a mechanism that was upsetting to a lot of people, which was basically uh, a reliance on what's called joint and several liability, which it wasn't market share liability, although that could play a role. Basically, if you had deep pockets, if you were still in business, if uh, you could pay, you were in principle on the hook for anything um, the government could get out of you. So it's a cautionary tale. I think there is a definite analogy here. Um, if I were in the industry, it would be a motivation for me to get really in front of this problem. Um, because if there comes a time where um, the, the, you know, 
global institutions d decide we have got to solve this legacy problem, they're then gonna start searching for responsible parties and that can be very expensive um, and even for the deepest pocket uh, leading companies. All right, so thank you. I mean, so challenges of, um of balancing appropriate, you know, appropriate government role versus um, encouraging, you know, and allowing industry activity to continue, right, is something that um, is, is fundamental. And I think, and, and I mean, the questions we're looking at, and it's clearly a, a, a discussion that we could pull out of that of, of that experience um, uh, as well. So, all right. Um, so I'm going um, to pose this one to, one to everyone. And it kind of relates to something that we're talking about in this panel, but also the, also the, the, the prior panel. And that is um, the role of standards and, and, and standards for behavior and industry voluntary commitment to standards versus um, allowing innovation and allowing um, new activities to continue and to, and to, to not um, become overly, overly specific. specific. Um, so as, as entities develop standards or norms for, for responsible behavior in space, do we have any concern about that being a, an activity that becomes um, anti-competitive or um, leads towards particular um, standards, uh, entrepreneurs or innovators um, dominating things for their own, for their own benefit? So, so the question is how do we balance, do standards contribute to innovation or do they, do they um, help us think about being responsible or are they a, a concern around um, around limitations? Yes. <laughs> uh, just quickly, yeah, again, this is a fascinating question. Uh, sorry to keep using all these analogies, but um, you know, this, this in the auto industry, for example, fuel economy standards, uh, you know, the industry leaders can, in principle at least, use tight fuel economy standards as a barrier to entry uh, to reduce competition. I'm not going to go so far as to say that's anti-competitive in a legal sense, but there is a close connection and intertwinement between competitive advantage and standard setting, uh, definitely. So um, Chris and, and Nishant, maybe for you, um, is acting responsibly as a new operator, is that a competitive advantage? Um, I think right now there's still an inclination for people to cheat um, and to cut corners. So I'd probably in the, that suggests that the answer right now is no. Um, but, you know, I, I think I have observed that at least people who have grown up in this industry typically behave responsibly. Um, so, um, you know, it's nice that they're not cheating. Um, but we, I think we need to change that. And then on the standards part, yeah, I would be reluctant to say, see, um, you know, one of the burgeoning, um, you know, the upcoming uh, space debris removal companies, um, you know, patent their connector and mandate, you know, that everybody use that connector and then have them have a monopoly on that because, frankly, we need, you know, these are tow trucks, right? We need, we need lots of tow trucks. We need every country to have a tow truck. Um, and so I think that's one thing where we might want to avoid um, you know, monopolistic behavior. Um, now, if you've built the thing and you get to fly it, that's great, but you shouldn't stop other people from um, also, um, you know, launching their, to their tow trucks um, and uh, cleaning up mess as well. So. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the other things that Secure World is involved in is facilitating an industry group looking at standards and best practices for satellite servicing known as the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations or CONFERS. And that's a, that's a discussion we're having, Chris, in that mm -hmm. group is that we see interfaces and interoperability as an important future enabling factor um, for this on-orbit infrastructure and on-orbit servicing development. So how do we facilitate that conversation that allows, you know, individual business models to progress, but you have that, that commonality of, of functions. And so that's a, that's a, that's a, it's an ongoing conversation, but it's a, it's a very interesting, I think important one. Um, another thing that you just, you just hit on. So is there a business advantage to being a responsible actor? And he said, you know, I see, see people in the industry are thinking about this and we've talked about people coming in from outside of the industry that maybe are not as, as familiar. It seems as an element of culture there, right. Of, of corporate culture of, you know, industry culture. And, and so, um, you know, sustainability, space sustainability has an operational impact, but how do we, can we design or can we encourage firms to think about it 
from a culture standpoint? What what mechanisms yeah. can we consider for that? And I'd be curious to hear. I don't want to. I don't want to put this all on Chris, um, but I'd be curious to hear reactions from the other panelists as, as well. Why doesn't Why doesn't someone else go first? Yeah, yeah I mean, I I can uh, address part of that one. Um, you know, typically, uh, space operators that are seeking to ensure uh, risks, whether they be in Leo, Geo, uh, wherever they may be in space, um, you know. My job is to understand what their business plan is from a technical perspective, financial insurance, et cetera. Um, so there's a big, uh, there's, a, there's a large um, uh, process of asking questions that are very detailed and seeing how those answers are responded to. Uh, typically when we say, you know, are these actors behaving responsibly, uh, the fact that they're even seeking insurance to me is an indicator that they are being responsible. <laughs> Um, so, so that's a positive sign in and of itself. The, the, the challenge is for the risks that I don't see, that I don't get to evaluate. And right now, because the industry is moving at such a, uh, a broadening at such a fast pace, it's difficult to see who is the good actor and who isn't the not so good actor, because I, I, I tend not to think that anybody's really a bad actor, because if you're investing uh, money and effort and resources and building the right teams and putting asset into space, you, you're going to do it at some point uh, to some level of responsibility. To me, it's when I see the risk, then I look at it, then I can evaluate, okay, how responsible are you being versus are they being responsible or not? Yeah, so that, that comes back to, I mean, I, I've heard other people, I think in, primarily in the context of the space sustainability rating, but say, you know, good behavior is the baseline and what we're trying to do is incentivize behavior beyond, um, beyond that, right? So um, appreciate that. All right, um, I'm gonna pick up on that a question that, that, that I am asking from the moderator's prerogative um, in encouraging people to, to stay on that good behavior baseline. And I want everybody to answer this. Um, what is more effective, shaming bad behavior or diversions from that, that baseline or highlighting, incentivizing um, better behavior? So if I can, if I can start. Um, so somehow operations in space are quite transparent in the sense that uh, it's not so difficult to spot who is maneuvering, who is not. And in fact, the, let's say the bad actors or the most dangerous objects are actually uh, well known. Um, however, this has not uh, been particularly helpful in these last years if we look at the, the level of compliance to mitigation measures that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. And this is exactly why with the space sustainability rating, we are trying to shift this attitude towards instead trying to highlight uh, good behavior and spot, uh, put in the spotlight uh, the operators that are responsible. Because we think that in this way, this can serve also to uh, present positive examples of uh, technological or operational solutions uh, that have been proved to be successful in terms of debris mitigation. So that's why we want to go in the direction of, uh, yes, uh, promoting uh, the, the good behavior. Anybody else? Shaming or calling out positive behavior? Yeah. I mean, I just thought, oh, go, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to uh, uh, take it in a slightly different direction and not answer your question. <laughs> um, and I think um, one thought I'm having is um, who's doing the shaming and the rewarding is an important question. Um, and this relates to the power of <clears throat> kind of consumer attitudes and consumer demand, <clears throat> the way um, people in a supply chain, for example, will reward um, socially responsible behavior or not. And uh, a question I have for your community, that shame and reward thing tends to work really well when the consumer sees very clearly um, a connection between what they're buying and what the problem is. So, you know, conflict-free diamonds would be an example there. I'm having a harder time I don't think that at the consumer level, there's an awareness of that connection to what's happening in orbit. I mean, I'll use myself as an example. If 
let's assume Starlink is screwing something up up there. Am I part of St uh, Starlink's supply chain? I have no idea. And so I'll just throw that out there as an important thing to think about is who's actually doing the shaming or the rewarding and how strong is that connection going to be felt? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so I mean, there was one notable example last year of someone who did cheat, which was Swarm. And I mentioned them by name because I believe that having at least one notable example of something that is considered fairly aberrant in our community is great because it scares the crap out of everybody else. Um, and I think it did scare a lot of people. And my observation, in, you know, speaking to other people was just that it reinforced that I can't believe they did that. That's, that's really bad. And that little neuron that flips and gets recommunicated to other people, which is that's really bad, is, is really important. So I think there is an element of public shame that is valuable. That said, if you have people that are marginal where they're like, they just don't know how it works, there's no real value in shaming those people. Um, they just, that's where you really want to just encourage them, hold their hand through the process, explain, invite them in, um, and the things we already talked about earlier, in, you know, t educate them. I think that's, yeah. that's the, the primary tool here. Yeah. It keeps coming back to that, that education and awareness piece, right? Um, yep. Yep. As, as the critical element of this. And Jim, thank you for, I think you just raised a very good point. Um, the space industry is not yet a particularly consumer, you know, as, as in terms of individual consumer driven market, it's a government driven market, it's a business driven market, but in terms of end use consumers, it's very much several steps removed, right? You may be using, you may be watching direct TV or something or using GPS on your phone, right? But your connection to the orbital, the orbital environment and the risk thereof is, is fairly removed, right? So I think that is a that is a challenge that we do face in terms of who's doing, of, of where the pressure is is, is coming from um, very much so. Um, Nishant, anything to add to this before I go to the next one? Yeah, I think um, from an insurance perspective, you know, one of the principles, uh, you know, just the law of large numbers, right? It dictates that the losses of the few are paid by the many. Um, so inherently, I think that buyers of insurance are incentivized to behave responsibly, responsibly to do the right things that they need to do when they face technical challenges or business challenges um, to, to de-risk their, their profile. Um, and if they do that, um, you know, that, that benefits them and it benefits the, the next guy buying insurance and the next guy buying insurance. Uh, although when you have uh, an issue, um, depending on how that issue played out, uh, that's, that pain is actually felt not just by the customer dealing with the claim, but also by the future uh, customers that have similar risk profiles. So I think um, you know calling out the good behavior is is the the right way to build that um, you know reserve of premium. That's ultimately you know there will be claims. Uh, we all have to expect that. And if everybody behaves responsibly, then that pool grows and it is able to cover and create a sustainable uh, insurance community. Yeah, thank you. I mean that's an indicator in and of itself of success, right? Is growing that that pool and that, that available or that purchase. Um, all right, so we got about 10 minutes left here. Um, I'm gonna go back down to some, some detail level questions here um, before, before we wrap up. So um, the first one here from the, from the audience member has to do um, with, a, with a very core trend that we're seeing in our industry, which is the emergence of these very large, often called mega constellations um, in, in low earth orbits. Jim, you mentioned Starlink, right? That, that's one of the key examples, Amazon, OneWeb, some others. Um, the question is, and it's interestingly phrased, it's phrased as why cannot or why can't we have some international body like the International Telecommunications Union govern the allocation of orbital altitudes in a model similar to air traffic control? Um, is that, um, is that a model that we should be we should be looking at, or is that something that um, is probably beyond um, beyond need or, or reason at, the, at, at this time? So, from the from the technical perspective, uh, we we look at the example of ITU as an inspiration, uh, and we ask ourselves uh, how this could be reflected in terms of uh, allocation. Even if from uh, our perspective, we don't think that an allocation based on altitude, uh, it's the maybe the most uh, appropriate one. Um, but for example, with this idea that I mentioned in the beginning, where we look at the, the impact of emission 
what we do is uh, what we try what we can try to do is to understand which is the the maximum capacity of the environment how, how we call it so which is the number and the type of missions uh, that are compatible with the stable evolution of the environment over time so to avoid that we have a condition where we have this exponential growth in the number of objects and our idea and we are doing uh, some research and some activities on this topic is exactly how you can start from this concept to then derive uh, an allocation mechanism that uh, can take uh, this into account and uh, be sure that the new missions that um, are launched are uh, within these boundaries so that uh, also in the future it would be possible to have sustainable operations. Yeah, so tra transparency and measurement and, and understanding and then, then think about what what regulatory changes or anything needs to be made. That seems to, to be a, a reasonable uh, perspective. So uh, Nishan, I have an insurance specific question. So you see, you, this one's gotta go to you. Um, uh, cybersecurity is something that we're seeing more attention to um, in the space community right now. We just saw in the last few days, the Trump administration came out with an executive order um, relative to this topic. Um, so the question is, how does the insurance sector look at um, uh, cyber issues for satellite operations? Do you provide um, insurance specifically for cyber security risks or is it too hard to estimate the the cost and risk level associated with that. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Yeah, it's a this this actually is one of the uh, uh, you know growing uh, risk concerns in the space insurance industry today. Uh, as of recently, actually, um, the the risk is actually excluded uh, for some very specific language that's in the policy wordings today. Um, you know, does does it make it hard to estimate the costs? It still does. Um, it is hard to estimate the costs, especially when the uh, security posture of a lot of the companies that we evaluate are different. Um, we have, uh, I think a lot of space buyers today that come seeking insurance uh, will we'll now start getting used to seeing questions that are related to cyber as the uh, broader space insurance industry tries to understand what that risk actually is. Uh, and because it varies so greatly between operators, it's difficult to establish what that baseline uh, um, coverage should look like and what that pricing uh, in concert should look like as well. So it is, uh, today it's excluded, um, not to say that, uh, you know, in the future, if we understand it better, that they, that couldn't be put back into uh, to, uh, to a cover. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, let's see, just to kind of um, scanning through the, the last questions here. Um, that we need to talk about, um, all right. Uh, so this may be a, this may be a question that, that, that is uh, rather difficult to answer, but um, we're talking primarily about responsible operations in the context of current um, environmental challenges, current space sustainability challenges and current business and technical practices, right? Um, so we're talking about responding to a current environment. Is there any way in which we can model or think about um, future practices that we should be thinking about now to to mitigate um, potential future problems? So, um, you know, I used to be a I used to be a market forecast uh, consultant, and you know, our job was to was to forecast the future. And I can tell you, every single study that we delivered was wrong, right? Because you 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 can take the best guess, and you can't, you know, you don't know the future. But how? Um, how do we think about um, designing now for, for, for challenges in the future? Is that, is that something that we can consider? And if, I've, if, I've, if I've ended the panel on a stumper, you can, you can, you can tell me that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you about us being wrong about our predictions. I um, had not expected Starlink to actually launch that many satellites. Um, you know, I didn't really think any of the mega constellations would really show up. And so Starlink at their launch rate is actually on track to possibly launch 10 to 20,000 satellites over the next few years, which is an absolutely astounding number of satellites. And I just don't think we're prepared for that because none of us thought anyone was really going to get the money to do it. Um, so I think we're behind. Um, so even catching up is mostly what we've talked about here today. Um, and then the, um, the, the future stuff, 
you know, maybe we need to start modeling worst cases. And we could have five years ago actually built the laws and regula regulations around mega constellations. But then I've observed there's a, re there's a reticence to do that because it doesn't seem real. Um, but we should have. So maybe we should take a lesson from that and actually plan around what we imagine to be future cases, even if at the time they seem unlikely. Yeah. And if I, I can add on this, um, so these uh, approaches that I, I mentioned uh, before, when we look at the, I, I said with this impact assessment, we want to have more granularity with respect to just checking the compliance to mitigation guidelines, exactly to go in this direction. We think that with this approach, we can be a bit more future proof. Um, because if we just look, for example, at the, at the number of objects that are in orbit or this kind of classical assessment, we may have only a, a partial um, um, yeah, representation of the, of the current situation, which does not really translate in how sustainable our operations in the future. So also from a technical point of view, we are trying to reformulate a bit the problem so that we can be a bit more flexible in, uh, in the analysis of uh, future scenarios. Flexibility, um, flexibility is, is is always is always important, right? Um, all right, uh, so we've got um, about four minutes here, so it's uh, it's time for kind of uh, wrap up and um, and, and closing thoughts. Um, I think what I'm thinking about as as the moderator after this is really going back to the, the awareness and education aspect of this. I think that has been something that, that each of the panelists has mentioned um, at some point um, in this um, in, in this uh, in this conversation. Um, and I think that is um, that is the, the key thing that we need to do as a community is just be sure that we are um, effectively communicating about where the challenges um, to the sustainability of the orbital environment are and that there are obligations that, that we have um, as a as a community to respond to them. Um, so uh, the, the question that I'm um, delaying to give myself time to formulate here is um, what, is the, what is the core of the business incentive that, that will cause operators um, to, to act responsibly and not require regulation to, to do that? Um, and I think each of you may have a slightly different perspective on that, but I'd be, I'd be curious to hear your, your kind of concluding thoughts on what is the core business incentive for responsible operations here? Well, well, one is to forestall future, less flexible, more draconian regulation. Um, and then I'd also point out regulation is many things. And I guess I would encourage the community to think about regulatory foundations that whether they're supporting uh, the insurance industry whether they're supporting flexible market-based uh, orbital allocations, even though those are flexible and um, market-driven, they work best when there is a, a governmental or regulatory foundation to kind of um, oil the machine, if you will. And so don't just think of regulation as this very heavy-handed thing that's telling you all what you have to do. It can also uh, be a foundation for um, a lot of, I think, the flexibility and efficiency you're going after as a community. Okay. Chris, anything to add to that? Yeah, so I'm a, you know, technologist at heart and, and, you know, when given an option, I'd always prefer to take a technological solution than a legal or regulatory one. And so one of the things we did at Planet was we designed a, a low speed radio that has a very wide beam um, that is very easy to use. And so one of the advantages of this radio is that, for instance, Planet, um, you know, when Planet drops, um, you know, 40, 50 satellites out into orbit at once, particularly on a ride share where there might be another 80 satellites, Planet is always able to find all of its satellites within five minutes, ID them, get positive contact with them, and then send the, you know, get refined TLEs from our GPS and then send those back into the community so that people can say, well, those 40, we know a planet, so ours is this. But other actors I observe sometimes spend two weeks sort of hunting for theirs, not sure which, which object is theirs, not really steering the antenna correctly. So the business incentive for that is that you can, you know, get, you can find your satellite. You're, not, you're never stuck with a lost in space situation 
um, you can get your mission up and running sooner and you can avoid collisions with other people and, and not lose your assets in that crazy mayhem of a launch. So that's one example of a technological tool that helps everybody, provides information to the other operators so they can ID their satellites and move them out of the way um, and get control of them. So everybody wins from that, but it's a simple radio. And so there are little things like that that I think should be possibly mandated. Maybe regulation can assist in making them adopted, but at the end of the day, this, we open source this radio design because we thought it was valuable for everybody. Um, and so people should just use it because it's actually better for your mission. And so all of the other things that we're talking about here today are side effects, but you can actually put your own self-interest first and say, gee, I wish I could find my satellite quickly and get positive control and get on with my job. And you can do that and benefit everyone at the same time. So this is not a, it shouldn't be a cost to people to be a good, to be a good actor. In fact, it can be beneficial. Uh, Nishant, Francesca, any quick closing thoughts? Um. Uh, sure. As uh, as Chris mentioned, I mean, uh, it, it good behavior shouldn't come at a um, uh, at a cost. Uh, I mean, it, there is a price, but you know, entrepreneur mindset. You know, they're they're success oriented. Um, you know, the insurance expense line item uh, on you know that they're thinking about may not even be contemplated until after they've raised maybe uh, you know a couple rounds of funding. Uh, until the risk becomes real to them, the risk of loss really becomes real, uh, and then they consider uh, insurance. Uh, not to say that that's too late by any means, but if they start thinking about it earlier on, um, you know, coordinating more with the investors, with the insurance community, um, and getting a feel for what that risk and how it develops and changes over time as their business grows looks like, that's what we really need to uh, to focus on. Yeah, and on my side, to connect um, to what uh, James was saying before, uh, so I also think that the actually the regulatory requirements are really important, but for uh, um, operators is also uh, an opportunity, the fact of being involved in this uh, best practice uh, definition, as they can really uh, contribute to uh, define what is the, the new norm and the more the, these actions are consolidated and more likely that they will be later on captured in new standards and new guidelines. So it's better to be involved in this process than just uh, be subject to it uh, at the end of it. So that could be also an incentive to, to this kind of behavior. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think that was a very interesting chat. We could probably keep going. Um, I think the message um, that, that good, good behavior should not have a business cost, but, but bad behavior probably does is something that we all can, um, can take away from this. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Crystal, for some um, logistical remarks and uh, on to the next element of our agenda. So uh, once again, thank you everyone on, on the panel. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you.